So I'm going to be talking about uh, basically an analysis of AeroWid trip reports. And let's see if this works. Yes, so this is my last slide. Um, we have a rough draft of a manuscript online. And so if anybody wants to just write down that URL and then go to another talk, I encourage you. Oh, so let's go back one. This will be up again at the end, of course. So as you heard, I have a background in studying hallucinogens in humans, and I've been involved in giving people MDMA for a number of years, as well as other psychoactives. And one of the things that I've been so sort of working on on the back burner for a bunch of years now is trying to find a, a way that is objective that can get meaning and insight from all these reports that we have online and in people's notebooks and other places about the experiences that they have when they take different psychoactive drugs. And so, as I said, I've been doing a bunch of stuff. Um, this research that I'm going to show you now is really stuff that I did in collaboration with other people at UC Berkeley while I was a grad student there. Jeremy Coyle, who's still a grad student there, uh, was an instrumental in this, and David Presti as well. And although we could have just probably like scraped the Arrowhead website for their data, uh, they were super helpful, and they've been really good collaborators. And so um, I, I can't say enough good things about them as supporting science. Since Berkeley and during my time at Berkeley, I've had the good fortune to work with a bunch of other people and at California Pacific Medical Center here in San Francisco, or over the bay in San Francisco, as well as at University of Chicago. And so although these people didn't necessarily directly contribute to the work, um, certainly their support and conversations is really important. A point that I want to make is that everything that I'm doing and going to show you today is open source. So much of what I did was done in R, which is a statistical computing language using two packages, Random Forest and another one, VerSelect RF. Um, you could also do the same thing in Python. And so I want the take-home lesson to be that there are really interesting, useful things that you can do with free tools and existing information. So sometimes you get the feeling that aside from you know, your own experiences, actually doing real psychedelic research is something that takes huge amounts of regulation and huge amounts of money. And there is research that's important that does require huge amounts of money and requires filling out lots of papers, but there's also stuff that is really just something that requires a computer and some programming. So by way of motivating this, for a number of years now we've seen what you might call anecdotal reports or experiences, but certainly just people have had experiences and they've shared them with each other. On the left we have a page from Alexander Shulgin's notebook, and this is page 186, which is the page in which he made notes about his first MDMA experience. And on the right, we have more or less random thing that I pulled off of Arrowhead, where somebody was talking about a psychoactive they took. It would be great if we had a way to understand these without having to read each and every one, and without necessarily filtering it through our own personal biases and consciousness. And so I'm going to show you some work that is just the first tentative steps towards doing that. Um, the reason that I think this is helpful is that there is more or less too many reports to read at this point. And so this is just an older screenshot from Arrowhead showing just one screen full of the many reports that are there, of which there's thousands. The second motivation is that we're having more and more data on what these compounds do pharmacologically. Um, this is an image I made from a recent paper where they looked at the binding of I don't know what that is, 15 different compounds at, I don't know what, 20 different receptors. So vertically we have the compounds along the, or, or rather the rows are different compounds and then the columns are different receptors and the color indicates how much it binds there. And the gray zeros mean that it wasn't tested or it wasn't uh, significant. It didn't really do anything at the highest concentrations. So we have all this data as well. And wouldn't it be great if we could combine the two things? So that's what we're trying to do, and we're going to go at it by trying to do a quantitative analysis of the trip reports we can find. 
To do this, we took 1,000 reports from 10 different drugs. And these were basically drugs we picked because they had at least 100 reports online, and we knew a little bit about what they were doing pharmacologically, and we thought there would be some differences, at least between some of them. Our approach is kind of a standard one, and it's also simple and powerful, which is we took what's called a bag of words approach, where we just said each report, we're not gonna really look at word order, we're just gonna ask whether words occur or not, so it's almost as if you just have a bag of words with no sequence. And then we count how often the words occur. And then we put them together into a matrix, which you can think of as looking sort of like a spreadsheet, where you have columns being a word, a row being a report, and then a number in the cell being how many times that word occurred in the report. We do some other stuff like normalizing them um, so that you don't have too much influence from say long reports and things like that. Um, and having done this, we have a whole lot of words, 22,000 and change. We take out the ones that we think are not gonna be useful because they don't happen often enough for us to learn anything from them. So like if a word only occurred once, twice, or five times even, of course it's gonna indicate, of course it's gonna be useful in identifying that report, but it's probably not gonna be useful in identifying that drug in a novel report. In order to reduce the words down further, we stem them, which means that we take different forms of the word and we turn them into one form, so run, ran, runs, running, all become one word. And we take out a bunch of words that would more or less be cheating or that would be not useful because they're too common, like the word ecstasy is gonna be really useful in identifying MDMA versus, say, DMT. And so we try to take out the actual terminology associated with the drugs or with taking the drugs. And this leaves us with almost 4,000 words. The approach we're taking is a classification tree um, where you use an algorithm to make a branching decision tree that's making predictions. So at each branch, there's some sort of test. And if the test is true for this uh, trip report, then you go to the left. If it's false, you go to the right. So in this case here, there's a simplified example where you ask, is the color red? And if it's red, you guess that you're seeing a fire truck. If it's not, you guess you're seeing a police car. So it's that sort of idea of like, ask a question, get an answer, go left or right. It's just like a logical decision tree. And there's a powerful technique that was developed at Berkeley called random forests, where you make a whole lot of these decision trees. We made 500 of them. Of them. And in each tree, you sort of take random subsets of the data and you make the tree on that, and then you test it on another random subset of the data. And after making this whole forest of trees, they together vote on which drug they think is in the report. And so it's kind of like uh, the wisdom of the crowd, but in terms of computer algorithms. So this might be an example of a single tree that we would make with our classifier. You would start at the top here and say, um, does the word visual occur more than a certain amount? And if it does, we go to the left, and then we say, does the word sex occur more than a certain amount? And if it does, we go to the left, and we say, well, we think it might be 5 methoxy dibt And you could go the other way and say, no, visual is not a frequent word. Well, is hug a frequent word? If it is, then let's guess MDMA. And so you have a whole lot of trees like this that are made by the computer where it uses one set of reports to develop a tree that's basically a theory, and then it tests on other reports, and then you keep the good trees. And in the end, you have this forest that is able to do pretty well in terms of identifying what the report is discussing, and also it works pretty well in identifying which words are important. So we start out with about 4,000 words, and one thing we can do is say, well, which words are really important? Which words could we just drop? And so we went through and we dropped words, and so along the horizontal axis here, we have the number of words that we kept in our tree, the, the um, starting on the right with a large amount and going to a very small amount of words, and then we have accuracy in identifying uh, vertically. And there's two shapes that are different. One is the square at 1,000 words, and that's our best performance was when we kept 1,000 words. But if we kept just 100 words, we actually got performance that was basically the same. And so there's a little bit of fluctuations as you decrease down there, but there's no significant difference between our ability to say, yeah, that person's describing LSD or they're describing DMT based on just using 100 words. And you can even do surprisingly well with like 20 words 
or 10 words even, but 100 words seems like it's a sweet spot in terms of it's something that you could actually look at and make sense out of. So here's one estimate of our accuracy with all the variables versus 100 words. And so um, you can see that it really does differ from drug to drug. The white line or the grayish line is all the words. And then the blue one, which is the lower in each pair, is the subset of just the 100 most useful words. And then we have each drug. And you can see, for example, that MDMA, which is third from the bottom here, is really um, pretty accurately guessed. So when people are describing MDMA, there's, a, there's some sort of consistency there that's not as true for the other drugs. And it's sort of interesting that like, if you look at the third one, down 2 ct 2 reducing the words from 1,000 words to just 100 words seems to improve the performance, which is something you sometimes see with this sort of approach. If you look at the bottom numbers, they may not look all that impressive, but I think it's helpful to remember that because we have 10 different drugs here that we're trying to learn about, if you just guessed by chance, you would expect to be right 10% of the time. And so we're doing well above chance in all these cases with our 100 variable subset. So one interesting thing that we can do is we can look at the mistakes that are made and try to use the pattern of mistakes, the confusion matrix, in order to figure out which things are similar. And so these are our results. And so along the columns labeled on the bottom, we have the actual drug. And then the rows are what the guess was. And if this thing were absolutely 100% correct, you would have a diagonal line that would be 100s because all 100 reports are right. But instead, what we see is that in this estimate of our accuracy, we are, we're only right for MDMA 87% of the time. And there doesn't seem to be like a real strong pattern in what we're, when we're wrong, what we guess. But on the other hand, if you look at the next two rows from the bottom, DMT and Salvia, we're about 50% right on both of those. And it seems like we're mistaking those for each other a fair amount of the time. And probably what's happening there is that these are drugs that are intense and short-lived and often smoked. And so having that like short-term effect may be something that is being described and is causing the computer to get a little confused. So I think there may be a right of administration thing going on there where those are overwhelming experiences. If you look up at psilocybin and LSD, uh, the fifth and sixth rows, I think, um, you can also see like kind of a confusion there, which may re reflect the fact that those are classical hallucinogens that have actually been compared and are actually really quite similar. And also that they're probably reports that were older and maybe written by older people. And so one of the things that's an issue with this sort of analysis is that there are also going to be basically demographic differences between users of different drugs. And so a lot of the reports of MDMA use are by younger people that are describing going to parties with friends. And a lot of the reports of, say, you know, some of the more like alphabet soup, soup research chemicals are people that are acting as if they're scientists like, like Shulgin with their notebooks out and they're you know, marking down what happens at each time point and stuff like that. And they're taking a much more analytic approach. And so those differences are going to probably come out here. We can also look at this uh, sort of confusion matrix or, dis or similarities in terms of this kind of branching tree. Um, and we can sort of look at it this way, where if we start on the far left, if you make one distinction, if you had to like slice the, the guesses that this classifier is making into two groups, one group would be MDMA by itself, and then it would be everything else. So MDMA really does seem different in terms of the classifier's guesses. And then you would make two groups after that out of the remainder. The lower group would be DPT, 5-methoxy-DMT, DMT, and salvia. And then your upper group would be the rest. And then if you split that upper group into two more groups, you'd again get psilocybin and LSD as similar, and then the 2-CT2, 5-methoxy-DMT, and 2-CE. And so there do seem to be some patterns here, and I can make pretty good arguments for why DMT and salvia are similar, or LSD and psilocybin are similar, and why MDMA is dissimilar. But at some point, we have to go in and look at what words are actually different between these things. So we can make this big, hard-to-read version of the same sort of table I just showed you, but in, 
and so we still have the, each column being the drug, the real category, and then now we have rows or words. And it gets much more difficult to read because we're dealing with 100 of these. If you are really interested, I would go to our online paper and look at figure three in the appendix, which is, a rep this is a small reproduction of it. But we can kind of zoom in and look at the bottom and just get a sense as to some of the things that we're finding here. And so by zooming in down here, you can see that it's really a light color on the left. And so these are, the lighter the cell is, the more frequently that word is appearing. And so a lot of the words that we're gonna look at here are ones associated with MDMA. And there are a few sort of obvious kinds of clusters. Like there's these ones that seem to be about emotion, like love and smile and hug. There's rave, dance, party, and club, which seems to describe the context in which the drug is being used. And then there's a, some at the bottom, like stomach, nausea, vomit, and headache, which for the most part actually seem to be not that heavily associated with MDMA and more likely to be reported with some of these other compounds, 2CT2 and the 5-methoxy-DIPT. And then for vomit, some of these ones on the right. And so that's sort of helpful in distinguishing MDMA because it doesn't happen that much, perhaps. We can make these sorts of word clouds as a way to just look at it. These aren't great for understanding the differences because the length of the word makes the word more visible even if the word is not as, um, as common as another word. And so um, the basic idea is that each word has a font size that's related to the frequency it appears in these reports. On the left, we have MDMA, and on the right, we have psilocybin, so shrooms. And the top words are gonna be generally fairly similar across these things. I mean, we only have 100 that I'm gonna look at anyway, and we can only see the top, I don't know what this is, 40 or 30 words to start with. Um, but you can see some differences here in terms of like, for example, MDMA on the left, up at the top there it has love and people. Um, and love I don't think is visible on the right for psilocybin. Um, and arguably psilocybin has more like kind of some perceptual or time-based words in it, like look um, next to trip. And trip is, you know, of course, the main word for shrooms versus feel for MDMA. So there does seem to be sensible differences here. It's pretty clear that there's consistency in word use for MDMA narratives that makes it easier to classify it, and this does seem to rep represent a, some interaction between where people are taking it as well as the consistency of the drug effects. There's a bunch of limitations to doing this, of course. One is that people don't always really know what they're taking, and so some of them are mislabeled. For Certain ones, it's less likely than others. You know, salvia is probably more likely labeled accurately or else it's a, they get nothing, whereas some of the powders, you don't really know. And another issue is that if people have strong expectations or if the drug has a certain reputation, it may take some time before that expectation or reputation kind of gets corrected by public knowledge. And I think I just went the other way and so what I've shown you so far is that 100 words are classifying these reports just about as well as 1,000 words. There do seem to be meaningful clusters, and I've argued that right of administration might be an issue, or might be one of the reasons, as well as demographics and pharmacology. And it does seem like we're at the point where we're starting to get meaningful clusters from this. Now, at this point, I'm going to sort of move into talking about the next step, which is trying to link this to pharmacology. And I'm not gonna show you any real results, so once again, I encourage you to leave and go see another talk. Um, but I think a way to think about this is that we have these different drug names, we have some phenomenological data or narratives, and then we also have this kind of pharmacological stuff like protein targets and binding sites. And it turns out that this is not just something that would be potentially of interest to people that want to know about research compounds or about psychedelics that may have new clinical applications that aren't easy to study. This is also something that's of interest to medicine in general, where in medicine there's a lot of work being done on 
medicines and side effects. And so instead of phenomenology, these researchers are looking at desired drug effects and undesired side effects. And it turns out that instead of just looking at the drug as a label, you can kind of take a drug and sort of expand it into a multidimensional um, vector where you can, you can say, all right, this, instead of just saying, well, what effects are associated with this drug, you can potentially say, what binding sites does this drug have and what binding sites are associated with effects. So each of these three things can be independently associated with each other. And so here's one example of some results that a group has where they looked at drugs that had similar side effects. So on the left here, we've got drug names. On the right, we have a bunch of different side effects. And they found connections where if drugs had similar side effects, you could potentially predict that, um, say, if they have like eight side effects in common and one is known to have a couple other side effects and the other one isn't yet known to have that, you might predict that maybe these are just undiscovered side effects. So you can cluster drugs based on side effects and use it to predict new, currently unknown ones. And so they took a data set up to 2005, predicted side effects that weren't known, and then they used a more recent data set and found that indeed a lot of their predictions were correct. One of the pitches that I'm trying to make here is that this is all stuff that anybody can do. And so I want to point out a couple of the useful data sets that are out there for doing this sort of stuff. I've already pointed out that we are using Arrowhead experience vaults for getting the data on drug effects. There's a psychoactive drug screening program that is um, an online database of drug binding, and it's also a service where academic researchers can request to have compounds characterized and screened for their binding sites. And so the earlier plot I showed you of uh, binding of different novel psychoactives was one um, that was generated from their data. There's an online protein chemical interactions website called Stitch that actually combines a bunch of different databases, and you can interactively look at what's known about different compounds in terms of their interactions. And so here's MDMA and DMT that I've plotted. So the drug is in the center, and then there's different uh, proteins or chemicals around the edges. And uh, it's hard to see the lines here, but the weight of the lines indicates the strength of the evidence or the type of the evidence. So here, um, okay. So another data set is CIDR, which is a side effects data set where it's basically, I think, about 1,000 drugs and I forget how many side effects in a downloadable matrix. So again, it's, this is something that would be not too difficult to combine with the data we have. And this is just a plot that the researchers who made the database made where they have side effects from placebo vertically and side effects from different medicines horizontally. And because the number scales are the same here, the vertical line is where you would expect something to fall if it happened just as often on placebo as it did on a drug. And so you can kind of see headache in the middle there as being like a, a side effect that probably isn't really a side effect. It's just that headaches are common. And so you see them when people are on placebo as well as on other drugs. Uh, but then there's a bunch of like technical medical terms down there at the bottom that are actually genuine side effects. So this is a really rich data set as well that we can combine. So what I've shown you is like some basic results suggesting, I think, that this kind of analysis of big data sets is going to be successful ultimately. They're pretty modest results right now, and it's nothing compared to the richness that you get if you read some of these reports directly. But one of the things that has been kind of the lesson of the last 10 years is that data is unreasonably effective, where with big data sets, you can really learn a ridiculous amount of things. And so you know, we have examples of things like computer translation that are really just based on having lots and lots of data. And I think ultimately, pursuing this path is going to let us find a way to make the quantitative and the qualitative approaches converge. Um, I'm not putting my exact slides online right now because I'm going to give a version of this talk in about a week, and I hope that by then I'll have improved and added to some of the analyses, but I will put it online eventually. I'm active on Google+, and so I'll, I'll announce it there, and if people use Google+, you can find this research community. And the manuscript of the first half of the work that I've showed you is online at this URL, and I'd be happy to take questions if we have time. Thank you.
I'll uh, start with one, which is uh, I think maybe this is more comment and question. I think uh, maybe another data set to link is expectations of people going in. Um, I arrived at this by thinking about like MDMA and well, maybe that uh, for some people is considered like uh, an archetype and if someone tells you it's going to be like MDMA, well, how does that uh, change uh, what you write about and obviously you're limited by what the data sets are. Do you think any of the data sets that you've mentioned or work with would be useful in trying to do that type of research? I think that's a really great point. And so one of the things that I'm doing with this kind of approach is analyzing data that we've collected in clinical experiments where um, people may be blinded to and not know what to expect. Um, but another sort of way to try and approach that would be to look at how the reports might change over time. And so often early on in the life of a compound, it's sold as being MDMA-like or it has a certain reputation because it was described in PCOL or TCOL as being a certain way. And then over time, as more people get experience with it, it kind of may converge on a, on a greater truth. And so you could just look at the dates of the different reports and find like some sort of pattern there that might indicate that, that there's some sort of phenomenon like that. Of course, if the expectation like really, really creates an experience, maybe it'll just stabilize in a random way, and it would be hard to know one way or another with that. But I think that's a great point. Hi, thanks. Uh, you mentioned uh, using a bunch of open source tools for this. I was wondering if your, um, the code that you wrote for this analysis is also released as open source? Um, basically, we started this project so long ago that some of the earliest analyses are you'd be better off starting fresh. And so like to stem the words, we wrote our own stemmer in MATLAB, whereas now like it's trivial to stem words with any one of a number of toolkits. And so I think the key thing to get out there open source or to get out there publicly would probably just be the data set since it was a lot of work to clean up. And so I think we will eventually just put that data set up, but it could certainly be replicated with novel data. But like the, the random forest uh, classifier is pretty um, robust and not too susceptible to uh, choices that the researcher makes. And so if you just downloaded the, like a standard random forest implementation, I think you'd find similar effects. Uh, hi, Matt. Uh, interesting approach. Uh, your 10 drugs and your 1,000 reports, was, it, uh, was that what you started off in the early part? So yeah. You selected those, did you, to where you were pretty sure that maybe just that drug had been taken, ingested? Because obviously the hidden variable here mm -hmm. is what else has been taken, and I'm talking about over-the-counters, coffee, alcohol, you know, as well as when you look at Arrowhead reports, there's just a whole raft of stuff. Even somebody says this is a DMT report, you know. He's taken 10 other things that day. So did you try and select for single drug exposures as best you could in, in doing that? We used the Arrowhead classification of whether it was a single drug exposure or not. And so, so they, they label them based on what the person says they took. But a limitation of that is that for many people, alcohol and cannabis and caffeine don't really count. And so that's kind of a random variable. Potentially, you could go through and see if those are mentioned, and then look at whether there's differences between, say, MDMA reports where they mention getting high on cannabis versus ones that, where they don't mention it. But kind of a problem is that cannabis use is so prevalent in this population that even if they don't mention it, you don't know. So I, I think we just have to accept that as being kind of noise unless we actually get controlled data. But, but obviously, it's something we can't completely ignore. I mean, we have mm -hmm. to figure it in as a possible variable that may contribute to some of the vari variation that you see. Yeah, and I'd be interested in hearing people's opinions later on offline in the hallways as to how that would contribute to it or like what, you, what approach you could take to trying to deal with that, because I think it is an issue, you're right. Uh, two short questions. The uh, similar, you mentioned different routes of administration could explain the similarity between DMT and salvia. Uh, DMT, as you mentioned in your paper, was user uh, insufflated, inhaled, or uh, oral. So could you, did you or could you vary by route if you collected that data to begin with? Yes, you could. Um, a reason that we didn't is because in the realm of 
this sort of analysis, 100 reports, is not actually that huge an amount. And so we were sort of concerned that by subdividing it, we would just increase the variability and the noise in our analysis. I think as we added more reports, I think that makes a lot of sense to do. And yeah, I think I'd probably do that um, at some point. Yeah, and your, your figure three with the actual words themselves, the boxes are from white to dark. So uh, I'm assuming that's based on a numerical value which you translate into a color. So you could do some statistical analyses by words themselves. But again, would that be a larger sample for that? Or could you do that with your existing data set? I'm not certain I follow the question. Okay, so, so, so certain words would be found to be statistically unique for a particular substance, the ones that correlate with white boxes, whereas right. the words that are more common, dark boxes. So could you turn that from qualitative, what color is it, to a quantitative, uh, some p-values? Still, not. there there's statistical measures of the importance of a word in distinguishing the reports. The statistical measures are like Gini importance and sort of more things that are slightly more obscure than p-values. Um, but you could treat them as being similar. Um, so yes, like this is all quantifiable. One thing though is that the one of these decision tree style classifiers or a whole forest of these classifiers, the the words don't have like a kind of single ling linear effect. You, you estimate their importance by kind of taking them out or by randomly permuting their values and see how your accuracy drops. And so it's not like a linear model where you can just say there's, each word has its own weight and it independently yeah. contributes because it's in this weird tree where like you don't care about whether the word you know, hug appears if the word visual appears a whole lot. You know, there's like that kind of nonlinearity. Thank you very much. <laughs>